A hundred plus years is a, uh, not a misnomer, but we'll see more than 100 years, more than 200 years of arts and architecture. And when I say the greater El Dorado County, you'll see why as you look at the slides and the slide list of uh, where we're going. So all the lights are out, so I can't see your, well, I can just guess. <laughs> I forgot about that. How many of you remember Guy Nixon speaking to us last spring, early summer about Miwok, Maidu, Nisanan culture? Wonderful, there you go, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So this, so I start with the first arts in El Dorado County. Thanks. Well, I'll leave it off. Let's just leave it off for now. Just, I'll just assume that you're all giving me a thumbs up because you, you just know this and you're not afraid of being called upon to answer a question. You're just a thumbs up kind of Renaissance society. So if you look carefully in the center of this rock, you'll see some deep holes. Uh, some of my college students who like to party along the South Fork think they're uh, Budweiser can holders, <laughs> but they're not. This is the Miwok Nisanan Maidu grinding rocks for acorn grinding. We've long lost the pestles that go in the grinding rocks. So this is far older than the last 100 plus years of arts and architecture in our county. This photograph I took at the Union Cemetery at the corner of Lotus Road and Bassey Road, just west of Lotus and the South Fork confluence uh, of South Fork River. Uh, through the fence is actually private property. But I begin here because it's important when we taught high school and college humanities to define, broadly define the word art or arts. Arts encompasses for our definitions today, not just art as in painting or, or, or pottery, Anything made by human hands or the human voice or the, by the human body, dance. Anything crafted by humans for any of many purposes, religious purposes, uh, uh, tools are, you've heard the phrase arts and crafts, right? So this really is an art in the sense that I'm defining art for today. It was something made and used by the native peoples for many centuries. Easy way to remember it. You go to the beach and look at the seashells. That's not art. You take one clam shell and make a tool out of it to dig for a clam bake, it's an, it's an artifact, and it could be in the Sacramento Museum right now. If you bring home those seashells and put them on your windowsill with some driftwood, that's art, because you have crafted something out of nature. If you make them into earrings or a necklace, you drill holes in your seashells, you have made art. If you sing about your love of seashells, you have made art. If you paint the seashells, you have made art. You see where I'm going with this? Art is a very broad definition, and it really is a very handy definition because we can think of all these uh, 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 products of our human culture and our human imagination and our minds and our hearts and our, our spirits. It's all art. So this goes back who knows how long, and there are numerous um, Maidu Miwok grinding rocks along the South Fork and elsewhere. You may have heard of Chausse Grinding Rock State Park, which has hundreds of grinding rocks. So I had to start here to tip my hat to Guy Nixon and the first art makers of El Dorado County and beyond here in California. Let's see, now I have to just see the space bar. More recent arts, baskets by definition can't be 100 or 200 or 300 years old because they're used. And when they're used, they wear out. I have seen, witnessed with my own eyes, I think Judy Johnson was there that day at the American River Conservancy, uh, soft boiling an egg over a campfire in, the, in a basket. I kid you not, and when the lights are back on, Judy can say, did you make that up? And I'll say, no, I, I saw that. Um, but look at the art, look at the geometric pattern. Think of the weaving that the Maidu Miwok, mostly women, wove to make this amazing basket, which is now among many in the California State Indian Museum. To the right, flicker feathers, a common bird. You spoke about bird, we're gonna have a bird presentation next year, so learn your, learn your feathers and bird calls now. Uh, the, uh, the headdress for ceremony and dance uh, on the head in this black, another art form. Photography is an art form. How many have heard of Ansel Adams? When he was a young man, the museums of America and the galleries of America didn't think photography was an art form. They thought it was a brownie camera for rank amateurs. 
until folks like Adams said, no, this is a legitimate art form. So the photograph itself is an art form. And the Maidu Miwak dancer, uh, 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 tribal elder is, is wearing his, his art. So we have to start with our native people first before the gold rush and before, as we know, the decimation of, of those people in that tribe. Uh, re reconstructions of the Maidu Nisanan Miwok uh, dwellings. This happens to be a Georgetown nature area. If you ever go to Georgetown, which is in El Dorado County, it's up the hill. There's a beautiful park, beautiful trails. There's an entrance to a gold mine that's sealed up, but you can hike there. And I present this as my first of many uh, works of architecture in this slideshow. Unfortunately, the, the dwellings in the Gold Rush Discovery State Park have been boarded off at the entrance because of graffiti and vandalism. You can no longer go inside, which I find very disturbing. I live six miles from Gold Rush State Park and the American Conservancy Nature Center and the blacksmith shop and the Argonaut. I do a little local pitch there for coffee and lunch. But some tourists have, have um, not been kind to these structures. But I want to suggest that architecture is a significant, lasting art form in, among other places, El Dorado County. OK, uh, I may define the term romanticism, romantic, romantic era. The term is used in several ways. It usually means, in my field, capital R romanticism refers to that century between roughly Beethoven going deaf and, and the, the, you know, the Ninth Symphony, Ode to Joy, and roughly World War I, when the public taste for romantic arts and poetry about uh, daffodils became moot after 20 million plus deaths in the battlefields of Europe and the style went out of style because no one was interested in capital R romanticism. But it really means a century of very popular arts, all fields of art, music, poetry, novels, um, paintings, statues, buildings, that suggests a heightened uh, uh, emotionalism and, uh, and, and heightening of, of, of the favorite word of the romantic poets was words like glorious, for example. It first began in, in the Swiss Alps with the painters going up in the Alps, painting plein air and painting the Matterhorn and painting and then hiking became extremely popular throughout the entire 19th century. We could go get in touch with God in nature as different from being in touch with God in your church back in your village or city. So what we have here is a California form of romantic landscape painting. Happened in Europe. Idyllic paintings of the English countryside, little, little thatch-roofed houses and windmills and lugubrious rivers and weeping willows, partly in response to the Industrial Revolution when millions of English moved to London and Liverpool and worked in sooty factories. Think Charles Dickens, right? Remember the uh, Christmas Carol? God bless us, everyone, tiny Tim. That's romanticism. So the paintings were of nature. Now in America, it began on the East Coast, particularly along the Hudson River with some famous American painters. They call it luminism, which meant the shimmering light uh, on the snow. Uh, not, there's no snow-capped mountains except in the winter. It, they call them mountains. We call them hills. <laughs> I mean, the Appalachians, 3,000 feet. You know, we have <laughs> Sierra, Tahoe. <laughs> 8,000 feet. But the style became popular of painting the wilderness. And in America, as the painters moved west, and they moved as fast as they could get behind the cavalry and the army and protection from the Native Americans, and painted and photographed eventually Native American uh, dwell, uh, uh, tribal lands. You've heard of Yellowstone National Park? It was actually became a national park because a huge oil painting by Thomas Moran of Yellowstone made its way to Washington, D.C., and all the, uh, the Congress saw it walking in and out of the, build, of the Capitol building, and they realized the glory of American landscape, not just Yellowstone, but you'll see it soon, Yosemite, Pikes Peak, Lake Tahoe, uh, Grand Canyon, and, and points further east as well, the Appalachians, the Great Smoky Mountains. So for America, 
we didn't have a Matterhorn, except more recently in Disneyland and Anaheim. <laughs> but we painted those places. Typically in a romantic painting, frequently there'll be a small human figures. Here is actually an idyllic Native American tribe, a boy coming back from the river with a homemade fishing pole, a hide-covered dwelling, a dog, of course, two dogs. Uh, you can't see it easily, but a mom holding a baby in a cradle board. It's, it's, and, and, and so it's a family of Native Americans dwelling in harmony with nature. Now, you may know this place, Sugarloaf Peak. If you drive 50 east, heading to South Shore, and look to your right, just above Kyberts, you will see this mountain. And, this, and the reason why it was Thomas Hill painted it in 1865 is it was a stagecoach stop. Kyberts. In fact, I'll just do a quick aside because I lead cemetery tours. I can show you where the Kyberts are buried um, in um, just, just east of El Dorado Hills. So it was a stage stop, and folks like Thomas Hill painted the beautiful California, everything from Mount Tamalpais to Mount Shasta to Mount Whitney, um, uh, to all of those mountains. It was very popular. Another example of the same thing. Notice the dates, 1865, 1869, 1873. This is miners in the Sierra, also in the... Nope. Sorry. I can't even see my own space bar. There we go. Miners in the Sierra. Now, romanticism isn't that interested in fact, okay? There weren't that many miners that went up to what was now Desolation Wilderness at the top of the Sierras to mine for gold. They found the gold in the foothills. Right from, you know, from roughly Chico all the way down to Murphy's and in the foothills. But that doesn't stop the romantic imagination from, from imagining these few hardy pioneers, these, these uh, trailblazers, if you will, the horse and a pack and, and shovels going into this, again, popular word, glorious High Sierra. How many have ever gone backpacking or camping in above 4,000 feet? You know what I'm talking about, and now you know why the painters were so drawn to these, these uh, landscapes. Um, and so we have the miners, this idea of the, of the gold rush, uh, and, and kind of exploring it in, in, uh, in kind of idealized, mythologized way. You're not, you will never see the McCullumy Hill. Remember when they washed the, the gravel and rock away from the hill, and now there's nothing there but, but uh, sludge in the river and all the rocks behind, you know, east of Rockland. The, the romantic painters don't paint devastation of the environment for industrial <laughs> mining purposes. They paint the ideal uh, uh, vistas and snow-capped peak with, with uh, you know, I'll give you another example not outside of painting. There we go. Romanticism occurs in literature all over the century we call the 1900s. Bathed in such beauty, watching the expressions. Oh boy, I see the problem. Here. <laughs> I'll read to you. Ever varying on the face of the mountains, watching the stars, which here have a glory that lowlanders never dream of. Listening to the songs of the waters would be endless pleasure. I practiced with my wife, and she said, do a Scottish accent. <laughs> I said, I can't. <laughs> the whole landscape showed design like man's noblest sculptures. How wonderful and glorious the power of its beauty, exclamation point. So Muir traveled the Sierras for Yosemite for the first time in 1869. His book didn't come out until 1911. Uh, but if you, if you think of hundreds of poets and novelists. I'll give you some examples uh, of the Romantic era in the 19th century. There's kind of two, two waves. One I would call optimism, essentially, like John Muir. One I would call like the dark side of Romanticism. Equally intense, but macabre. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe, Dracula, Frankenstein, the Bronte sisters. That's all Romanticism. And it can either be dark and about death and about lost love, or it can be 
like Beethoven's Ninth Symphony Ode to Joy. It can be bright and uplifting and inspiring and empowering. So John Muir, of course, was a major spokesman of the Romantic era. You might remember the great Walt Whitman, right? Oh, Captain, my Captain. You know, Walt Whitman was a classic, a wonderful example of Romanticism. Easiest way to be a Romantic poet, I can teach you how. Somebody call out a simple common noun not a person or a place, but a, a thing, preferably from nature. Leaf. Leaf, excellent. Okay, so you ready? Now, if you're a scientist, you go, oh, leaf. Oak leaf, maple leaf, sycamore leaf, right? Uh, uh, deciduous poplar leaf, uh, you know, uh, and so on. But if you're a romantic poet, you go, leaf. Oh, leaf, exclamation point. <laughs> oh, wondrous leaf. Glorious leaf falling from the tree like, like death, exclamation point. <laughs> to rise next spring. They don't use the word compost, but um, so that's how you write a nature poem in the style of a capital R romantic. That, that's your homework for our next meeting. <laughs> Lake Tahoe. Uh, how many have been to Lake Tahoe? I can't see you in the dark, but let's just, if you haven't been there, please go. It's wonderful. It's not very far away. It's just 35 miles east on 50 or 80. But we see the romantic landscape, the mist-covered waters known as not the Caldor fire smoke. It is a, a, a divine wreath of mist of God's greatest creation, which is, which is the uh, nature, which is the, uh, the snow-capped peaks. And we see, again, just a couple idyllic figures of small one-person boaters, perhaps catching the, uh, isn't trout, there's a certain trout native to Lake Tahoe. Just a peaceful scene. You'll see the same kind of painting, and some of you may have been to New York or Boston or Maine or New Hampshire, where they paint the Atlantic Ocean or the Hudson River or the River Chesapeake with the same pristine, um, light-filled style. That's pure romanticism, and these painters wanted to put Tahoe on the map. But it isn't just 19th century painters. You could be a romantic, actually I admit I am a romantic, uh, in the 21st century, you, how many of you think you recognize the painter? <laughs> okay, I kind of thought so. Okay, yeah. So, so it's not really romanticism. It, it, the best term is either the neo-romantic or contemporary romantic, or, or this is, this is I'm, I'm Thomas Kincaid, I can paint what I want, and I can sell it to you. Um, <laughs> the, the, another idea besides uh, untouched nature is the idyllic village, the small town, whether it's New England or Virginia or the Midwest farm towns, this place where the Norman Rockwell town, where crime doesn't happen, <laughs> and um, you know, there are no, no one hanging by the neck on Main Street. <laughs> Oops, did I say that? Um, <laughs> but we have this, this Crispus in Placerville. Again, this, this evokes the buggy. Look on the upper left roof of the Cary, is that the Cary House Hotel? No, this is the Bell Tower. No, it is the Cary House. You see a snowman on the roof with a father and son crafting a snowman in the very upper left corner. On the right, just the side of the girder pillar behind the Model A, oh no, sorry, it's, it's right there. There's a dad with a, a little toddler on his shoulders uh, watching the Christmas parade. It's, it's a kind of uh, warm nostalgia, which really is romanticism, and yet it's, it's uh, a Kincaid update. But it's not limited only to painting. It works with photography. You know our local terrific photographer, Paul Cockrell. You may have heard of Paul. I've, I remember uh, uh, Paul, his, his daughter, went to high school, Union Mine High School with my son. Bell tower, glowing lights, um, the atmosphere. So, so Paul is also evoking that same colorful um, patina over this, this place we call home. So you can find those kinds of romantic uh, ideas and images um, throughout the last century and carrying on in today. Many of your Hallmark cards, many of your greeting cards, many of your, any of these image Christmas cards, 
like it used to be, you know, grandmother and the sleigh across the fields we go and, and cut down our own tree and bring it home and put it by the fire. This is, this is romanticizing uh, Christmas in, in Christmas card art, which is still very popular. Okay, this, I have to explain this before I move on. The term I'm going to use is revival. Revival is a subset of romanticism. There were numerous revivals of very, uh, becoming very popular arts throughout the entire century. This painting is by Thomas Cole, is pretty famous. It's called Architect's Dream from 1840. And you see on this pillar over here, the architect with his uh, pre-blueprints, whatever they call them then, uh, dreaming and imagining a, a new America with a whole new architecture. And this is the best example of the, the big revivals of the last century, going clockwise. From the left, Gothic revival refers to any church in the style of the original Gothic cathedrals. Have anyone been to France? Notre Dame, Chartres, right? England, Winchester Cathedral, Germany. The French, the Europeans built huge cathedrals in the 12th century, 13th century. America began to revive the Gothic church style uh, around Civil War-ish era. How many have heard of St. Patrick's Cathedral in downtown Manhattan? Or uh, have you ever been to uh, St. John the Divine Episcopal Cathedral in New York City? Has everyone been to New York City? I see a field trip coming. Okay, <laughs> let me charter a bus. Okay. Uh, so, Gothic revival. Going clockwise in the far distant, uh, you see the Egyptian pyramid. Okay, and just in front of it, uh, a Egyptian temple with the, the floral columns. That's all Egypt, ancient Pharaonic Egypt. It became immensely popular after Napoleon's troops uh, <laughs> trashed Egypt and took stuff away, like the Rosetta Stone, for example. And they found and sketched and stole everything from, I don't know, King Tut's tomb, and they translated all the hieroglyphs. So Egyptian art gripped Europe and eventually America. What is, you all know our first president, right? <laughs> okay, <laughs> don't ask me. Right. <laughs> and his monument in Washington, D.C., is that a Christian monument? Is that a colonial monument? Is that a U.S. Army monument? It is a Egyptian obelisk, right, built before and then they finished after the Civil War. And what does America have to do with Egyptian pharaohs? No one thought George Washington was a pharaoh, right? And, and we, we, vote, we vote for presidents. We don't have pharaohs. But it became very popular. Look at your $1 bill when the lights are back on. There's a pyramid on the back of your $1 bill. Popular um, uh, icon for the, uh, the uh, Masons, the um, Masonic order. So that's a good example of Egyptian revival. Moving clockwise, the domed structure, easy way to remember it, my students know this, Rome dome, dome Rome. The ancient Greeks didn't have domes, okay? But by the, the Russian, but Russians, <laughs> wrong country. The Romans developed concrete and made the domes. The best example that's still there in downtown Rome is the Pantheon. So think of the Jefferson Memorial, built in what, 1926? Looks like the Pantheon. You all heard of Abraham Lincoln's memorial, I hope. Moving to the right in my clockwise. Greek revival looks like the Parthenon. And that became an extremely popular style. So think about Washington, D.C., the Capitol, mm -hmm. the Supreme Court building, the original Supreme Court building, the Department of Justice, how many white columns and with or without domes have you seen in our nation's capital? Or how many have been to our state capital, Sacramento? Do I see another field trip coming? That was, why? Because that style was extraordinarily trendy from mid-1800s all the way through World War I and beyond. So with that in mind, these types of revivals, let me show you El Dorado County. This is not, that is not El Dorado County. Um, Okay, some of you know this pretty well. Some, like Leslie, go there every Sunday and play the organ next door. The first church in El Dorado County, uh, this is called Colonial Revival. 
easy way to remember it. Colonies. 1776, we were 13 colonies, right? By 1856, we were no longer colonies, but we were bringing with us that simple wooden style church, that New England Protestant chapel architecture came west with the settlers. Unlike England, Germany, France, Italy, we didn't have a lot of masonry, a lot of stone cutters, a lot of good, we couldn't build stone edifices in America, but we had abundant forests and we could build wooden structures. So a little white clapboard church with a steeple uh, is an example of colonial revival. The word revival means it happened once long ago. Americans revived it because they liked it in their art and their sculptures and their buildings and, and their music and everything else. Um, so I was found out that some of the woodwork in the side came around Cape Horn. And this, the ME stands for Methodist Episcopal, which is a little confusing sometimes. The Methodist Church, its full name really is a Methodist Episcopal. Remember, I teach religion too. Um, the, the African Methodist Episcopal Church is the all black church, uh, which uh, developed even before, well before the Civil War. This church used to be on Cedar Ravine and Main Street and was moved to Thompson Road Street. Way, Way thank you. I knew that. Uh, where currently Federated is right next door. Also, the oldest cemetery in the county is right next to this structure, the uh, Methodist Episcopal Church. Okay. Uh, that didn't work very well. There. Emmanuel Church in Coloma, Gold Rush State Park. It's now surrounded by chain link fence. You cannot get even close. It's not safe. There's a still unsuccessful multi-million dollar fundraiser to, to repair, refurbish, and reopen Emmanuel Church. It began in 1855 with an Episcopal uh, sponsorship, but the minister was, the first minister was Pierce, was Methodist. Again, white whitewash, white paint, wood, steeple or bell tower, that's colonial revival. It's the churches they built back home in the east. Um, and it's, it's uh, I actually had the honor of playing a wedding for two Union Mine High School faculty on the pedal pump organ. Inside Emmanuel, this would have been 22 years ago. So I do not know what shape the organ is in or anything else inside the building. Just, just 100 yards to the north, St. John's Church, uh, the first Catholic church in Coloma. Behind it is the St. John's Cemetery with some of our leading Catholic uh, founders of Coloma buried behind there. The bell came from England. Except for the Celtic cross, you really can't tell it from any other church. And just so you're aware of this, think about this, it's, it's never too late, but think about this. In historic cemeteries, Catholics were buried in Catholic cemeteries and Protestants were buried in Protestant cemeteries. And there was always, <laughs> yeah, between the two, right? Um, so, so St. John's was, and just historically, the Catholics were a tiny minority. At the time of George Washington, General George Washington in the war, Maryland had a small, enclave of semi-safe Catholics. They were 4% of the population. By the time of the great Irish immigration, and then, and then German, Italian, French, English, then the Catholic, Catholic Americans grew to be half our population. Hence, St. Patrick's Cathedral is the Irish American Catholic uh, way of saying we're here and we're not leaving, basically. So the St. John's Church, beautiful church, open for weddings, special events, talk to the rangers at the uh, uh, Gold Rush State Park. Uh, New Vine Fellowship in the corner of B Street and Hobby 49 has that colonial revival with red brick, which you might see in Virginia, you might see that in Maryland, you might see that in the, in the colonies, and you would see that in England as well with the ivy-covered walls. I called their phone number to ask about the church when it was built. They never were called back. Actually, their phone message was full. So, um, but my best guess is it was probably a, a, perhaps a Lutheran or Episcopal, not Episcopal, Lutheran, some denomination probably built anywhere from the 20s to the 30s to the 40s and still in use today as anybody from New Vine Fellowship 
feel free to help me out there. So, uh, Colonial Revival in Red Brick. LDS Church in Folsom, built when Folsom Lake College was opened in 20, around 2005. LDS Church is commonly builds churches and seminaries across the street from colleges and, and high schools uh, for the LDS students to go and study. The LDS has actually a, somewhat of a structure of architecture. They have, a, they have a steeple, but no cross. Typically, it's the angel Moroni on the top of the steeple blowing a trumpet. And you see the red brick, the white paint, the kind of colonial look to it, even though it's colonial. Uh, if you Google Colonial Insurance Company, some of their uh, branch offices are going colonial, even though they were built in the last 30 years. Uh -oh. Let's see. And houses. I would call these contemporary colonials. The one on the right actually is a half mile from my house. I took a picture when I was walking the dog. It's in the Lotus Coloma area. If it looks like you've seen it in National Geographic in some president's boyhood home, you know James Garfield from 1860, but it was built 20 years ago, it's a contemporary colonial. It's a farmhouse, but it's California. The one on the left, how can you tell it's not colonial? Or even colonial revival, hint, look at the roof. Solar, Solar. yes, this house is five years old. But if you ever see a, a white wooden house, frequently with black shutters, for example, uh, you're seeing this colonial look far from the thir original 13 colonies, right here in El Dorado County. Uh, I mentioned classical revival. Classical means Greek and Roman. Greek and Roman. Now, the Greeks and Romans made statues, lots of statues, some unclothed statues. I, you're all 21 or... Over, okay. Um, so this is Columbia, it's in the Crocker Art Museum. And it's a, it's a Roman demigoddess of some kind, it's extremely popular. If you ever go anywhere and see any fountain, including in Europe and Italy, it, that would, might be Renaissance. Renaissance were the first to grab Greek and Roman style, that's why they call it a Renaissance, and built statues and fountains and little naked cherubs piddling into the fountain. That's all Greek and Roman revival, so, and so is this. Uh, so you, the, the, the white marble sculptor, um, I'm not using it because it's not El Dorado County, but there's a famous statue of George Washington. You won't believe it, Google it sometime. Google image, George Washington with no shirt on, buff as can be, with a toga, <laughs> made in 1830 by uh, 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 Howden was his name. <laughs> Turns out the American people weren't ready for a Greek, <laughs> Greek god, Washington. And so the story is they, they couldn't d turn down the sculpture because they commissioned it. So they put it behind a hedge somewhere in the back of the, of the Congress uh, uh, Capitol. And it's, now it's in the Smithsonian Museum. I've actually seen it. So if it looks at all like a Greek god or a Caesar, anything in a toga or wearing less than a toga, and, but it was made recent, uh, in the last, uh, 200 years ago, it's Greek revival, classical revival, Greco-Roman revival. This is your cemetery, uh, B Street, the Uniontown Cemetery of Placerville, the most popular funerary architecture in our county and in this century evokes Greek, Roman, and Egyptian. Let's see if we can decode this, this cemetery. This is, uh, on the far left, look behind the one with the urn, you see an obelisk, yeah. and an obelisk, and a broken obelisk, and an obelisk, and an obelisk, and probably a broken obelisk, and another, and this one's a shrouded obelisk. Notice the, the Freemason yeah. symbol on there. Freemasons were a major fraternity in our county in, in the last century. Uh, the shroud is part of that um, death decor, is that a word? And uh, the, the, the Greek, Grecian urn. So if you wander around, we have dozens of cemeteries and I lead cemetery tours. You will find copious examples of Egyptian revival uh, cemetery markings. Um, if you went back 200 years, back east, 
colonial England, uh, America or England, you would not find that. It was not in style. It was not done. The early, early colonial were simple markers with just a name or maybe a cross. Maybe if they were wealthy enough, they could put a, a, a big marker and maybe some scripture. By the time of the Romantic era, if you had the money, you bought one of these. The inscription would include the deceased, um, how many years they lived, how many months they lived, and how many days they lived. And frequently, some kind of poem not from the Bible, not something strictly Christian, like, Oh, angel, to thee, to heaven thou fly. We'll meet you there someday. You know, I'm, I'm ad-libbing here. <laughs> that was the typical common romantic cemetery uh, style. This is Middletown Cemetery right next to the uh, First Lutheran Church on the north side of 50. There's a cemetery back in there. I'll let you decode this one. So, um, see this round thing here? The name is uh, 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 Wilmans, and there's a, a, a Freemason um, compass, but it's a round thing. I'll give you a hint. Greek and Roman ladies, when they got tired, if they had money, the rest of them were slaves cooking and they would lie down, right, on a couch. And they would put their head on, what do you call those things? Pillow, Pillow or bolster. Okay, now, I know what R.I.P. means. Tell me. <laughs> Get the idea? This, I mean, this was, yeah, I could, you can find a hundred of these within five, ten miles of right here if you're looking and they're all from the 18 gold rush 1860 to 1910 and then it went out of style um, okay Do uh, donner memorial in um at donner lake the statue is significant in many ways it's the, p the pillar upon it which it rests indicates the exact height of the snow that the Donner Party was trapped in, I mean, to, to the inch. That's why, it's, that's why it's displayed that way. But what makes it classical revival, Greco-Roman revival? Well, a very simple answer is the Romans made statues of senators and Caesars and Caesars' families and wives uh, in, in 2,000 plus years ago. When it revived in the Renaissance, they made statues of the great Italian dukes and, and duchesses and, and, and so on. Then it revived again in America, the style and the material. Bronze is very common, a bronze uh, form. Think of the Civil War statues. Think of any general on any, either side of the Civil War. You'll find dozens upon dozens, Stonewall, Jackson, Robert E. Lee, uh, General Grant, General Sherman, and there's always a statue of or, and even unnamed um, privates and, uh, and militiamen, right? And it's, it's this, this stalwart, brave soldier. Well, America, California was nominally in the Civil War, but didn't have that many war heroes to celebrate. But they had the Donner tragedy. And so we get this image. Now, you can decode this family, I presume, right? A st stalwart dad forging on, looking to the west, looking to Sacramento for rescue. Remember they did send unsuccessful rescue attempts from Sacramento uh, to bring food to the starving Donner Party. Uh, the wife with babe in arms, and behind them a daughter hiding behind her dad's knee. You, you see the drama in that, right? The, you know, um, in fact, I read somewhere when I was doing my research that somebody rewrote the plaque and took the word cannibalism out. <laughs> That's what I read. Uh, so the tourists wouldn't be so upset, I guess. I don't know. Um, but this is the uh, California version of that very common statuary of that entire century, which includes so many different statues from Admiral Farragut to, who, to you know, Wild Bill Hickok. Here's one in old Sacramento. I, remember I said greater El Dorado County? I'm jumping county borders on this show today. Uh, you, know the, you know what this, right, this is the Pony Express, okay, yeah. Before there was snail mail, before there was email, there was Pony Express. Uh, this isn't technically romantic revival because it was made 30 years ago, so it's kind of neo-neo-romantic revival. 
because it's old Sacramento, the tourist attraction, right? So you need to re represent our, our uh, um, vigilant, you know, brave. You know, the, you've heard the story about how they record a Pony Express guy. They gotta be really young, really lightweight, really skinny, really good horseback rider. They don't get to carry a weapon. They, a pistol is too much weight for a Pony Express. So when 14 unhappy Washoe Native Americans chase you across the mountain, you can't shoot back. Uh, so we were celebrating the Pony Express. You might remember Remington, not, not the weapon, but Frederick Remington who made those bronco-busting bronze statues. You still see those on people's coffee tables. This is along those lines. Remington fits that same genre, that same era of, of uh, the Wild West and horses in full gallop and so on. And of course, James Marshall. Uh, I love it. It's, a color, it's called a colorized postcard on the left and the regular black and white photograph postcard on the right. They are actual postcards. Uh, they used to colorize photos. The word for that is pictorialism. Make a photograph look like a painting. That's what they were doing. And they sold these widely. And of course, James Marshall saying, yes, there is where I found the gold in my right hand. Quartz, rocks full of gold in my left hand where I found it. Uh, and I think that's a pistol and a holster under his, his right arm. On the right, this is on Highway 49 entering Gold Rush Discovery Park from the south, from Placerville. Have you ever seen it? Gone right by it? Okay, it's, it's called Indian something, I know. There's a fundraiser going, I gave them $100 to fix the hand and, the, and both hands and the ear on the horse is gone. It's, a, it's, 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 I presume, it's cement. I have no idea who made it. I have no idea how long it's been there. It just happens to be seven miles from my home. It's modeled after the one on the left, which is a great example of capital R romantic statuary of the Native American. Typically imaged as noble, virtuous, undressed, and doomed. Doomed by manifest destiny. Right, you'll find this all over, even the photographs of Curtis show Native Americans. He got Native Americans to get out of their normal work clothes, like you and I wear, and get out of their jalopies and put on tribal wear and then take their photograph holding something, they don't know what it is, uh, to evoke the red man before the, the white um, uh, arrival of settlers and, and the army. So, the one on the left, I think I just pulled it off the web from Boston or somewhere, because I know it's the model of what's on the right. But we all know what happens to statues, can happen to statuary, <laughs> if the Miwok Maidu Nisanans remind us that, well, you know, James Marshall brought the, the destruction of our tribe, as Guy Nixon told you about. One could see, perhaps, this happening in places closer than this is Richmond, Virginia. That's General Lee. My point is, my big point is art has power. Art matters. Now my students sleep through my slideshows, but I try to wake them up by saying, you know, people get excited about art in, in all kinds of ways. So I am not, I'm not, I'm not critiquing what they did. I'm just showing you the power of, of images and their, and their importance to the American understanding of, of who we are. Greek Revival, always look for white columns. This is a bank, J Street, Sacramento. Uh, slide, we're on slide number 28, built in 1912. This is one of the peak, turn of the century was peak. Time to build banks, courthouses, offices, uh, um, uh, government buildings, museums, libraries. If it has white columns and it's white, it's got little curly cues on top, it's definitely Greek classical revival, one much closer than Sacramento. You must know where that is. Uh, hopefully you've been there only as a guest or on the jury, not in, in some sort of trouble. This is our courthouse. It, part of the reason it's Greek revival is not just because it was a super trendy style, but also because the previous courthouse burned down because it was wood. And the courthouse here in Placerville before that burned down because it was all wood. So sometimes if you build a Greek or Roman revival or even a Gothic revival stone, cement, masonry, structure, brick structure, you can, you can reduce your chances of, of uh, elimination by fire, right? 
And this is, I like it because it's a postcard. Okay, there it is then. Here it is two months ago, three months ago, and I took this photo. Notice what makes it Greek Revival in part. There's no columns, obviously, but look along the roof line and below the roof line and the gutter line and then the circular uh, imagery and all the, I call it frou-frou. It's, it could be ivy, it could be olive branches, it could be all kinds of things. And then right over the door, that kind of crest shield thing, that's, those are all the hallmarks of Greek revival, classical revival. The Carnegie Libraries, Carnegie funded hundreds of libraries. This is in Grass Valley, still open. Lovely library, this is slide 31, built in 1916. Carnegie would pay half of any library, any town in America pitched to them, we need a, a public library. Now think about the Greek temple. The Parthenon, it was a temple to Athena. It was also the Greek treasury. They kept all the gold in there. So why would a bank want to look like the Parthenon? Because it safely protects your gold, right? And if it's a temple, a holy temple, well, what's in a library? Books, right? Philosophy, history, knowledge. It's a temple to knowledge and learning. And because it's a public library and it's free, anybody can go in, learn to read, and devour the books in the library and, and uh, become a very productive citizen. So this is a lovely example of one of many Carnegie libraries still uh, open. We're going now to Gothic revival. Think cathedrals, the original Gothic. Not Goth, there's also Gothic as in people who wear all black, but that's, they borrowed the term from what we're talking about. Uh, this is the closest Gothic church to here. This is um, Our Savior Episcopal Church in, no, sorry. This is uh, St. Paul's in, in Sacramento. Doesn't have the flying buttresses, but it's a terrific example of uh, the gray stone, the, uh, uh, the stained glass, Gothic revival. Y if you didn't know better, you'd think it was built long, long, long ago, but no, it wasn't. It was actually built in 1903. This is one of my favorites. Again, I hope you were a guest and never a resident. Let me recognize where this is. Folsom Prison. They hired a noted architect to make a Gothic revival gate. The prisoners helped move the stones. Here's my other favorite. Look at that castle-like. It's actually technically Romanesque, but I call it Gothic because why not? It's close enough. But look at the, doesn't it look like, you should, there should be a moat, right, with a drawbridge. Uh, and just a trivial pursuit, all the California's license plates are made at Folsom Prison. Uh, now, um, you've heard of Victorian houses, right? You've heard of the painted ladies of San Francisco. Victorian is the perfect term for it, but technically it's a subset of Gothic revival, but even though there's no stone, it just is. I, I can't tell you why, it just is. Um, it, built in the 1800s, you know, the B. Bennett House on B Street. Lots of decoration, lots of uh, fancy trim. The word for it, if it's a Gothic revival house or church made out of wood, it's called Carpenter Gothic. If you remember the famous painting, Grant Wood's American Gothic, with the stern-looking farmer with his shovel and his wife and the pitchfork, behind him is a Gothic church in the painting, and that's why he calls it American Gothic. So if it's wood, this is Our Savior's Episcopal. I love the watercolor on the right, which they use in their, their um, bulletin and their website. I was fortunate enough to, I actually substituted as the piano player for that church last summer when they were between musicians. So Carpenter Gothic, built 1866. Vineyard House in Coloma was once a major winery. Uh, is considered Carpenter Gothic. It's also considered haunted. Go on Google, look for all the TV shows about the ghosts in the Vineyard House. It used to be a restaurant. Does anybody remember the Vineyard House? It's right across from the old Coloma uh, Cemetery. Fits that wooden Victorian style so popular in the, in the late 1800s and into the early 1900s. Just think pre Earthquake, San Francisco, and how many, 5,000 houses in, in, in that style. So, moving on, new style. This is called Rustic Revival. 
rustic. It's, you might recognize this is the ranger's headquarters, uh, ranger house behind the Marshall Monument, right next to the parking lot in Gold Discovery Park in Coloma. Became quite popular in the West, mainly because the National Park Service adopted this style as their uh, signature style for all their ranger buildings. You would see something like this if you go back in the deep woods maybe of Kentucky or even further back to Scandinavia. One famous one, so this is Coloma, the ranger still lives there. I need to talk to them about an interior tour for my next slideshow. This is the ranger's quarters and clubhouse and dormitories in Yosemite National Park, Yosemite Valley, see the style? Pitched roof to get the snow off, stone fireplace, a lot of redwood shingles on the outside. Paid for by Stephen Mather at the time, who was the superintendent of the Park Service, out of his own funds. I guess he had some money, because he had this built at his own expense for the Rangers. Uh, Julia Morgan is the architect. You might remember her somewhere around south of San Luis Obispo, north of, who's that famous castle that she designed? <laughs> Hearst Castle. This is Julia Morgan, the most successful uh, woman architect in California. It's a, a summer home for a wealthy family built in the 1940s, finished around World War II. Lots of stone, lots of wood shingles, fits in with Lake Tahoe. It's called Rustic Revival. Okay, our second to last, oh, we're running out of time. Second to last style is modernism. Oops, Mission Revival. That's right, one more. Mission Revival. Anything that looks like a California mission but was built recently is called Mission Revival. I only toss this in because I happen to have worked there as a music director, choir director, and have recently been rehired. After 35 years, they called me back. So <laughs> I worked there, and they kept the style in their huge remodel 10 years ago. This is the back of the church. Keeping that, if you ever see terracotta roof and adobe walls whitewashed white, you know you're looking at Mission Revival. There's Vicini's office on Placerville Drive. Got the roof. You'll see it a lot in Santa Barbara. You'll see it a lot in California. That, that, that's a distinctive architectural style. Frank Lloyd Wright, modernism. This is actually in the nearest, it's Clio, California. It's a golf course, a lodge, a restaurant, and a resort. It's exactly what Wright designed in 1923 for, for a Wisconsin, whatever, lodge, golf place, uh, but was never built. This was built in 2010 and has an excellent restaurant. If you like a very well-made martini, may I recommend it? And what makes it Wright? Well, Wright loved uh, geometry, uh, uh, cantilevered, uh, uh, horizontal, vertical. This is supposed to look like a wigwam in the Native American. This is the standing fireplace. This is the five-star restaurant. Look on the interior of the ceiling is his Wright's take on Native American um, geometric shapes. So it is a Frank Lloyd Wright, except he never lived to see it get built, but he designed it. Designs. It's exactly from his design but made much more recently. And it's a, I've, I've, go there, I've been there frequently because I, I like it. All right, so do you know where, all right. Highway 80, go to Truckee, turn left, head north on 89, 80. Gray, gray Eagle. Spelled like Gray Eagle. Gray Eagle, Gray Eagle. On the way to Quincy. It's just in the middle of nowhere. You'll get lost, trust me, I do. Right near there, in the 18 hole golf course. It's, it's called um, Natoma, uh, oh, the town, Clio. Look, look at slide guide number, I lost my place. I can't see it either. Uh, 44, thank you, slide 44. Modernism is a definition as a rejection of romanticism. Modernism really shot to the top of the art, the world as a style in the 20th century after we discovered um, uh, uh, reinforced concrete, steel beams, glass. The, the late World Trade Center is modernism. Any, any skyscraper, anything vertical with frequently modern materials is modernism. And this is a house that's in modernism style somewhere in Lake Tahoe. 
It uses wood because it's Tahoe, but it's still modernism. It's very, very geometric. In art, you remember abstract expressionism? People throw paint on a painting and then they sell it for a half million dollars. And you say, I could do that, you know? That's, that's modernism. That's modernism in art, okay? And it became a very trendy style. A subset of modernism is Art Deco. Uh, if you recall, the Chrysler building in downtown Manhattan is actually Art Deco. Look at the, the font, if you will, of City Hall. The word, wait, yeah, what does it say? <laughs> I can't read it. Uh, whatever. whatever, Art Deco. This is downtown Main Street, Nevada City. I lost my place, sorry. Uh, that's the courthouse, courthouse, there we go. This is City Hall, okay? And a current, I, I just heard a rumor that there was a, 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 a measure on their ballot how to replace these buildings or move out of these buildings, just like Placerville. Aren't we talking about moving to a new, larger courthouse someday here in Placerville? Same thing is going on in Nevada City. Art Deco was really big in the 20s and 30s. If any of you remember watching the early uh, the uh, uh, Hercule Poirot mysteries, they often used Art Deco houses for their shoots. Very common. So Keith, yeah. Um, and you know, I don't see in the building as much yeah. Art Deco, but you mean right. by the by the yeah. sign and yeah. the use of the the, the font, the the the, the right. that stuff. Uh, oh, the cur the curved edges. Oh, I should go. Oh, I see. Watch for the curved. Curved edges, I, um, yeah, that was on the last slide, I went a bit too fast. This you might recognize if you've ever driven down Main Street, Placerville. Um, now, Zieg is, was the founder of the first um, Druid Grove in California, and he's honored by this particular monument. What makes it Art Deco, look at the flame. You guys heard of Tiffany's in New York City? It's kind of a, a rosebud or, or torch glass uh, style, and it fits exactly in the peak of the Art Deco style 1926, when it was really big as a style, so that's what I think they borrowed from. Of course, they stuck it on a Greek column, but that's okay. And now there's, <laughs> there's rumors we're gonna build a roundabout. That's what I've heard. Um, so, and if you wanna know more, more about Zieg, I'm writing an article for the Around Here magazine about all the men's fraternities of the 19th century, and Zieg and the Druids are one of those. Uh, the spring issue, thank you. Yeah, January through March. If you read the last issue, there's a piece by me on a historic cemeteries. So look, look for that. Yeah. Oh, are you here? Oh, good. That's the publisher and owner of Around Here magazine. And she, it's a terrific, did you bring 50 to give away? Oh. All right, we'll put them on the table. I'm glad, glad to see you even though I can't see you. Uh, uh, you have heard of Bennett sculptures. They used to have several studios. Uh, so Bob and his brother, um, Tom Bennett. Technically, this is postmodern. Now, let me try to explain. Modernism in, 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 in uh, sculpture took an interesting turn. Have you ever driven down like Sacramento or any major city and see something at the corner of First and J and it's a bunch of steel things and you don't know what it is or why it's there? And you go, what is that? And it's just like, you know, that's modernism. Think, um, what do you call the things you hang from the ceiling and they, uh, those thingies. Um, mobiles, that's modern mobile modernism, starts with an M, okay. Uh, so so it, we're now in the postmodern era where we've rejected modernism. It's too abstract, no one understands it. It's for art snobs, it's for the, the New York intelligentsia, it's, it's uh, the, and so postmodern artists of all stripes say, let's make something we can enjoy, understand. So, um, so this is Bennett, and it's not a Greek nude or a Roman, it's not, it's not abstract, it's, it's a lot of hair and a, <laughs> yeah. Now the daughter Terry Bennett made this one, which actually tends to harken back to modernism. Perhaps Terry Bennett didn't want to make uh, uh, hopelessly underweight, uh, busty fe <laughs> females. I don't know. I'm just saying. Uh, so this is the Bennett sculptors of the 
1990s. Um, I include our Veterans Memorial. What makes it postmodern is a variety of things. It's built recently. The, you see the big round globes behind it, the big bowling balls, flags at half mast. Uh, a good example of postmodern is, is Maya Lin's Vietnam Memorial with all the name, the wall of names in Washington, D.C. is actually postmodern. Postmodern can be, be eclectic. It can draw from anything in the past and bring it into the art. It is frequently multicultural. It is frequently made by and for amateurs as opposed to professional artists and sculptors and, and architects. Um, it can frequently have a sense of humor and it doesn't need to be decoded by an academic. That's what makes everything post-mod. And that's what we're in today, right now. Example, this is an art form. These are reenactors of the famous Buffalo Soldiers, the African-American cavalry unit from the late 19th century. They have been stationed historically in California. They fought against Native American tribes in the Southwest and in the Rockies. And they are dressing as their Buffalo soldiers would have dressed, and they would, have you ever seen one in a parade? They, I think they've been to El Dorado County. So I, I bring it in for a couple of reasons. Without my Miwok Maidu, and without this, I'd have all 100% Anglo folks from somewhere making art in El Dorado County, and I wanted to bring the African American presence uh, into our county. And similarly, they all over 21. This is Ken Fox, was a, this is in Auburn. He was a dentist. I think he's deceased now, I don't know. Um, uh, the Chinese, uh, um, he's not a miner, he's a Chinese worker who, who helped dig the railroad through the Sierras and blasted the, hill, the mountains with dynamite at a great, terrible cost in human life. You know the story of the Chinese building the, the, the Sierra Nevada tunnels um, for the railroad. This is at the railroad tracks there. You see the box cars behind it. That's in uh, Auburn, downtown Auburn. To the left is a street called Auburn Ravine Road. That's, there's one of five nude figures. That's one of the smaller ones. There's the Amazons, or I, I was going to make more slides, but I knew I was going to run out of time, uh, are holding spears. Uh, the, the website says when they first unveiled these, and again, it's a dentist who made these. This is reinforced concrete. Uh, rumor has it the bus driver changed the route so the kids wouldn't see naked ladies <laughs> through the bus window on the way home and to school. But he has done, he's done a minor, the Chinese figure, three Amazon warriors. This is called uh, Freedom of Prayer. There's also a, one of a chained naked man with chains around his wrist. Cement man, about eight feet tall. Uh, just, just try Auburn Ravine Road if you're anywhere near Plas uh, Auburn. H highway 80, Highway 49. Uh, this is a sculptor named Van Houd. Wild Horses, it's on uh, Auburn Airport, Airport Road in Auburn. Bronze Horses, his studio is right across the street. And he's got some marvelous, beautiful, huge bronze sculptures. Murals, murals are post-mod. You might have heard of Diego Rivera and Orozco and uh, uh, Siqueiros, the great Mexican muralists of the 1920s and 30s and 40s. So Mexico really started <coughs> the public mural. And it caught on, it really is the hallmark of post-modernism because a group of students, a group of Club members, a group of Girl Scouts can paint a mural and everyone can drive by it and see it, appreciate it, enjoy it without a degree in art history, right? Uh, the last one was on Main Street across from Town Hall that I just put up there. This on, uh, I'll think of it. Green Valley Road, thank you. Green Valley Road, and uh, we don't know for sure if students painted it, but it's obviously our Gold Rush heritage on the multi-purpose room slash gymnasium of Blue Oak School. So whenever you see a mural, you're looking at postmodern. Um, and how many of you ever seen a box car with, graf with spray paint art all over it? <laughs> that is postmod art. Don't ever call it something less, because that's, they embrace that kind of art uh, um, as part of postmodernism. And even closer to home, if you drive Lotus Road eastbound, <laughs> Okay, I love this one. I drive by this frequently. Um, this, this is a terrific example of post-mod. Um, and it, it frequently it's for all the world to see. Uh, this is the South Fork American River. That's a lotus. 
A lotus is an indigenous water plant to India, extremely important in Hinduism and Buddhism. Um, lotus wasn't named Lotus to start with. It was, it was Un Union Town and then Marshall and then Lotus, hence the lotus plant. Uh, I don't know who painted it. I don't know when. I've lived here 31 years and I've been seeing it routinely along the South Fork. This one you might recognize. <laughs> Kobe. Kobe kills ants, right? Now, next time you ever hire a, a pest control employee of their company, tell them you are a, you're a postmodern artist, uh, Kobe Company, because they really are. I'll close now. I'm watching the time. My uh, friend, a terrific painter, Robin Magnuson Center. Uh, this is South Fork American River. This is the most recent art in the show. It was painted about four months ago for a Ladies Valley land back art auction to raise funds to return some land along the Kasumnas River to the Miwok Maidu Nisanon tribe. And Robin Center painted a lovely painting. I have two of hers in my home, and I'm just crazy about her work. It, it picks up some style of California Impressionism and, some, and a little bit of a George O'Keefe kind of a feel to it without the skulls and the desert. But it's, it's just, <laughs> I just think she's a terrific painter. She's, she, she, her family owns Camp Lotus, and her art is for sale uh, in the store which they're closed until the 1st of April. And she gave me permission to show you this slide. Um, so, thank you. I'm sorry I'm over time. <laughs>